Here we go. Oh, Janina Harding, first one in. Oh, goodness. Bang. Uh, Michelle Tahini, hello. How are you? Haven't seen you in ages. Rhoda, how are you going in this? I'm really well. Thanks for having me as co-host today, Wesley. Looking forward oh, to it. More than a joy. More than a joy. Great to see so many people coming in um, into the room. We've got about 14 members in the room, about nine sitting in the back room and on the panel at the moment. Esther, good to see you. Diego, Denise, thank you. And someone actually made a correction to me, Rhoda, because I kept saying this is like play school. And they said, no, 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 this is like romper room. Yes, I had That's that totally it. wrong. You know, where I can see Nick and Sarah Jane Moore. and. I I love seeing everyone from around the country. Hey, Janina Harding up there in Cookie Allenji and in Dingy Land. Hi. <laughs> I see Steve Miller um, there. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on board, Penny Smith. Um, yeah, lots of things to talk about today. I'll, I'll give you a little kind of heads up in a second, folks, that we, we've got a little change to the program, but um, we'll wait till everyone's in and we can have a bit of a, a chat then. And I'd just like to give a big hello to all the Opera House, particularly Catherine Shamney, our new producer for First Nations. They're all tuning in. Um, Tamara Jarvis Wood says, Rhoda, you look lovely. Well, um, I'm going to take yeah. that personally, that they don't think I do. But, um, <laughs> you know, it might be all about you today, Rhoda, which is I'm very happy to, very happy to say <laughs> it's all about you. Um, yeah, lots of interesting things coming through this last week where we're seeing you know, different changes, different lifting of the restrictions across the country. Yes, thank you, Tamara Jarvis-Wood. And Wayne Barker, hi. Oh yeah, I saw Wayne, Wayne Barker there before. Um, in terms of the lifting of restrictions around the, around the country in different ways, that's really interesting. I know here in Sydney, where I am, um, you know, you can now gather up to 10 people in a cafe or a restaurant, which is interesting. Um, not many people can afford to do that as you talk to cafe owners and things, but um, it'd be interesting to see how it goes. Though those in the Northern Territory, you can have parties up to 500 people, so. And I believe the Northern Land Council has actually opened a looking at permits for communities, but I just really, Wesley, we really need to acknowledge everyone to thank you all for really being aware of the situations that have occurred, particularly in remote communities. I think we've done an extraordinary job there. Yeah amazing job look it's still not over i guess we shouldn't let our let our guard down but just know that you know we should actually celebrate how how well we are doing in this country as i look at different figures around the world I mean, goodness i mean i think about first nations people living in turtle island at the moment both canada and the united states it's not a happy picture in some of those other countries as well mm. But um, when we go to a place like um, Ataroa and you see, you know, their, their fantastic uh, track record there too of looking after people. It's interesting that um, even there's a kind of, what would you call it, native police almost, you know, where, you know, Maori's stopping people from coming into communities and looking at their sovereignty in that environment to keep everyone safe. It's, it's very important in that way. Um, we've got about 45 people uh, online now, which is great. And we'll just keep giving people maybe a couple more minutes, maybe about five past two we'll start as we just get letting people kind of come in um, as we go through this process. Can I give a big shout out to an incredible woman who works amazingly with languages, Lenora Adidi. Hi there, welcome. You're so well connected, Rhoda. And I mean, yeah. you know everyone on this list. Look at them all. Look, there's Marinda and I, Michael, and of course, lovely to have Marion Potts with us as well. Oh, good to see you, Marion. Yes, a big thank you to all like Rachel Swain and various other people working within the First Nations space. It's lovely to have you with us. Uh, Ros Abercrombie, great to see you from, uh, does a lot of work in the regional arts space as well, which is great. Sarah Bell, great to see you coming on board. Um, <gasps> Sarah now, where, Bell. Where, where are you in the world, Rhoda, as we look at you here? Okay, so I'm on uh, Bunjalung lands. I'm a Wijibal woman, and uh, I'm very fortunate to actually live in the Northern Rivers, uh, an amazing place. And I think what this COVID has actually done for me, Wesley, has really opened up what's needed in regional areas yeah. and it's a bit of a 2020 thing it's been amazing because when you're out on a property 
you don't really feel it. It's only when you go into town and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, big shout out to everyone from regional areas. Um, a big thank you and hello to Jennifer Martinello. Uh, I think you're still based in Canberra there, Jennifer. Good to see you. Um, people will know that Jennifer also um, uh, makes the the new trophies for the First Nations Arts Awards, which is not that far away, actually. We're going to do a live broadcast of the First Nations Arts Awards on the 27th of May. Um, you can tune in on that. We'll give you some more information as we go through. Just checking the time. It's about three past two. We have about 53 people online at the moment. Um, great to see everyone kind of piling in as you do. It's like a, it's, it's, people say that this is the Friday afternoon kind of relax, the end of the week, a little bit of kind of time out to connect up with each other and get the power of connection, if you like. Um, someone once called, I think it was, uh, I think it was Marinda, called it the hour of power. This idea of kind of, and you're, you're a preacher's daughter, you know what it's like. <laughs> Rosa. The hour of power, folks, yeah. That was <laughs> remember that. Into evangelical television. <laughs> <laughs> But it, a sense of power and, and congregation and coming together and sharing some time. Oh, Wesley's hour of power. Well, I think we can share this one, Marinda. It's um, everyone's hour of power. Though I must admit, you don't get a name like Wesley James Enoch by accident. I did grow up in a very strong kind of mission family in that way. But um, uh, it's good to have uh, a sense of community that comes out from these moments of joining in. All right, it's it's coming up to five past two. We think we've got we've got about fifty seven people online now, and hopefully people will join us a, along the way. How are you going, Rhoda? You ready to maybe make a start? Yeah, I'd love to. And I really uh, noticed where we're coming from. Whether the people are from Yorta Yorta or uh, you know Torres Straits or right across the country, Noongar country, and so I guess wherever we are, it is about acknowledging that we're always on Aboriginal lands. And uh, so I'll give a shout out because I'm on the Bundjalung land. So Ginny Walla would aware everyone. And uh, thank you for, this is a wonderful thing to co-host. Uh, fantastic as people now writing up where they're coming from in the little chat room. I'll talk about that in a second. Talk about your country, where you come from, where you're sitting on at the moment and give us a, a kind of sense of pride. Michelle, we might start with the, um, the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Oh, we might just jump back to the beginning. Here we go. Um, so just to say uh, we're here uh, in all our different lands and we're looking at this uh, First Nations Arts Roundtable talking about now and the future. Next slide, thanks, Michelle. And joining me uh, on, I'm Wesley Enoch. Uh, I love that I've got my little AM after me now, like I'm a morning person. Uh, and I chair the First Nations Art Strategy Panel, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Sydney Festival. And joining me uh, as special co-host this uh, roundtable is the irrepressible Rhoda Roberts, AO. Uh, she's the head of First Nations Programming at Sydney Opera House. Good to see you here, Rhoda. How gorgeous to see your face. Thank you, Wesley. And I've just got to give a shout out. I've just noticed some people coming in from Arnhem Land, so none made in here to you all. Oh, wonderful. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Thanks, Michelle. Just to say that what we're doing here is we're, we're gathering to talk through and connect, to get a sense of connection, uh, to also share ideas. If you've got ideas, things that you're doing, things that are really kind of um, working for you, share them uh, in this platform so it can, we can take those ideas further around. Those new ideas, you're here to take ideas, share ideas. And also to build up those networks. You might see people here, you go, oh, I haven't seen you for ages. And might go, oh, well, jump on the phone, have a little chat to them or put something in the chat box on the side. I'll talk about that in a second. And also we're here, Rhoda, to navigate our way through this COVID-19 and to do it together. Because um, goodness knows that we need more sense of sharing and getting sense of direction. Because I feel that we're, we're in some ways uh, been a approaching this and working much stronger than a lot of our non-Indigenous counterparts. We've been looking at strategies that work for us and really building that up. Next slide, thanks, Michelle. Um, we're just saying a little bit of housekeeping. We'll go through in a second. Some key issues and questions arising from last week's uh, webinar. We've got two guests and I have to just give a little uh, 
change of program here. We did say that Brenda Gifford and Peter White, and Brenda Gifford, Gifford who works at uh, the ACT arts uh, area, and Peter White, who works for Create New South Wales, both of those were going to be speakers, both of those people were going to be speakers, and they've had to pull out for different reasons. Um, I know there's been some family issues that have needed a bit of attention, so I know a number of these people have come out. And But we have the wonderful Nancy Bamaga, who's going to come in and talk to us in a, in a second, and uh, we'll give her a big rap when we come to that bit. And uh, Carly Belling, who is, I don't know, goodness gracious, she's, she's a living a national treasure i would say in this way you would know what that's like rhoda roberts you're a living national treasure as yourself well yeah i'd love that um kylie being at creative victoria but when you look at the work that she's done particularly the health and social well-being of our people to plan strategy and know all that that's an absolute coup yeah and isn't more more and more i see especially during this health crisis how arts and cultural thinkers are often leading the way about how we can think differently and reinvent ourselves. So it's a, it's a great thing to, to see. Um, and you've already given a little bit of acknowledgement of country there, Rhoda, but now that we've got a few more people in, do you want to just restate that for us and give us that yes. wonderful acknowledgement of country? Thank you, Wesley. I would like to acknowledge two countries, in fact, the one that I am on, Jingiwala Widawe from Bunjalung country, but also because I get to work at the Sydney Opera House, it is the lands of the Gadigal, it is the, one of the first contact points, and it always astounds me that we consistently see through our arts the continuation of culture on country, wherever we are, whether it's a high rise building or a flat plains or the mountain country, we are always on country. So welcome everyone um, to this webinar. Thank you so much. I'm seeing at the moment, Daniel Riley, sending much love and respect from Coolan country where he's sitting on at the moment. Um, Ella Peel saying there that she's joining us as a guest on uh, Yugen Bear country. Uh, um, Eva um, Malali, who spoke last week is saying uh, a big hello and a, a Great to be seeing the amazingness of Auntie Nancy and Kylie. Kylie, you didn't get an auntie in that one, so that's good. Not auntieing you yet. Uh, I got <laughs> uncle the other other week, and I just feel like going. Oh, maybe it's the beard that's coming on. People want to say uncle to me now. Don't you don't have to though, folks. You, you, you and a big hello shout out to Ryan Clapham. Oh yes, right. lovely Dobby there. You know all the amazing work and Wayne Barker popping in there to say hello in the chat box. In fact, if we go to the house, the housekeeping slide, the next slide there, thanks Michelle. Um, I'm just going to run through a few things. If this is your first time on the First Nations Roundtable, welcome, hello, great that you could join us. If you could take your cursor and just come down to the bottom of the page, you'll see um, a couple of boxes there that are very useful. There's a uh, participants box where you can then see who else is online. You can go, oh, you can have a little Doris. Who's in the room with you? What's going on? Um, and also that, uh, that there's a Q&A box that if you tap on that and you actually put a, 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 a question in, we can then uh, address that question either in the chat or in um, the, someone will respond specifically to you. There's also then a chat box. If you double click on that, there's a chat box that comes up. I've mean, just seen that Joseph Lafferty has added a big thing there to talk to Brenda Gifford about. I'm sorry she's not here at the moment. Uh, seems to be a few questions there about payments, I think, in that way. Let's, we might be able to forward that on to her. But that chat box is a very useful thing that you can talk to each other, talk to us. We'll keep an eye on that so that uh, we can bring the questions to the panellists or even Rhoda and I could go back and forward on things. Um, and that uh, oh, Val McGrath saying that she's she's living there on Waka Waka land to say hello. There's also um, uh, closed captioning there. If in fact your your hearing isn't great or the connection may not be working as well, that uh, you'd much rather read it. There's a closed caption box. You just click on that and it'll open up for you as well. So just the chat box, really useful to pass on ideas and and things to the whole group. A Q&A box there that you might want to raise a particular question to anyone, particular or general, and then also the uh, the closed captioning there. And check out who's in the room. There's now 78 of you. 
and there's a, another nine of us in the back room in the panel and things ready to chat. So that's a little bit of uh, housekeeping to get us through to the next thing. Um, next slide, thanks there. And Rhoda, maybe if you want to talk us through a little bit about what happened last week. Well, yeah, I have to say the discussions that are occurring around the country are so invigorating because everyone's looking at digital opportunities, but most importantly, looking at strategies and readjusting to ensure our artists and those producers and event organisers have opportunities during this period. So, for example, Rachel Mazza, the amazing woman from Ilbidri, um, talked about the stories that need to be in control, how Indigenous content needs to be in control, we need to be in control of our stories. I mean, Ilbidri has been operating for 30 years and of course the original, one of the founders of Ilbidri is Auntie Kylie Belling. <laughs> uh, I had an opportunity to actually see the tracker uh, that Daniel Riley's putting together. Wow, incredible yeah. stories. Young, vibrant, it does raise issues um, when we talk about making our own stories about our intellectual property and um, cultural uh, intellectual property. Uh, so Ibiljuri have done a huge body of work and they've actually put out that if you are in Victoria and you want to get involved in the performing arts, by all means, do co contact them regarding any opportunities. Big wave to Eva Grace. She's been working incredibly um, at Yira Yark, and they've got a number of writers groups, they're metro writers groups, they're regional writers groups. But I think big hats off to the latest productions that they've been doing. And um, they've put an expression of interest call out and received a lot of proposals, which they're working on to help realise pr proposals during this time. And Eva talked about the Yira Play Club, which actually pays artists to facilitate workshops and to remain creatively engaged during these unknown times. So that's just fantastic. Of course, Black Dance in Queensland with Marinda Donnelly. Hi, Marinda. Great work they're doing. And it was really lovely that these opportunities have seen many people acknowledge the pioneers and the finders of many of the organisations now that are at the helm of our arts. And of course, with Black Dance, that was Marilyn Miller. So giving a big call out to Marilyn last week, um, talking about a lot of spearheading projects. And of course, indeed, as most of the companies are talking about, is that self-determination. And I think with so many young producers now working at, in most of our major companies, that is quite extraordinary that we're going to see a change. There's huge advo advocating uh, with governments at local levels, regional levels, and of course, even international levels. Uh, Black Dance, of course, is also looking at ways <coughs> regarding our mental well-being, our spirituality, and how during isolation that can be incredibly overwhelming. I look at the dancers with Bangar and indeed all our dancers around the country and how difficult that must be to maintain your masterclasses and keep working at a physical level so that when we do get back to whatever the new norm is, you're still um, in touch with your craft. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and strategy, as I've, I've mentioned, across many people that I've been speaking to. And I think that Marinda mentioned it, Eva mentioned it, Rachel mentioned it. It is about the need for a national arts peak body that is an advocate who can go and lobby and we need to lobby those protocols, our policies, our intellectual, cultural and property rights. Um, and of course, look at what type of stimulus packages can be available and how they can be um, from a First Nations lens and perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think overall, um, the big talk about fits in with this week when we think of now and the future. We're really taking control. A lot of the work we're seeing is from our own gaze and philosophy, including that spirituality, which is one that often can cause 
uh, a lot of work for our people in the arts. I think that's one of the things that for those who um, work closely with First Nations, you would understand there is another level and layer of deeper work and consul consultation when we're working with cultural matter. And uh, I'm really delighted to see that a lot of people are now accepting that as part and parcel of the norm. So good things happening around the country, Wesley. Amazing things. And if, if people remember, if you were here last week with uh, Marinda Donnelly, she gave this amazing paper. She talked about a, a big ideas. And I, I, like you, Rhoda, was blown away by what Eva Grace Mullaly is doing in, in, with Yuri Yarkin. And so much work from that company. And Rachel Mazza, total star. Like, goodness gracious. I mean, three incredibly strong women who just are leading the way in so many ways. Um, a couple of people coming in. Uh, Wayne Barker saying wonderful things, saying that um, he's saying, thankfully, the Kimberley has survived the first wave of COVID-19 and the elders are safe. Wayne spoke with us um, early on in the webinar series and just that's a massive, massive thing. I remember I was quite emotional by listening to the threat if you like, that um, many of the elders in rural and remote communities were, were, were maybe experiencing the threat and that the things that we put in place have really helped look after people across the, play, across the country. Um, there's a question here from Vanessa Russ. Uh, she's in uh, Wajak Buja in, in WA, but she's a Kimberley girl and she's interested in what strategies are in place for art centres at the moment. Um, is, there, uh, is this an Eastern States discourse? Uh, or are there national plans? And I think that if anyone's working in that kind of art center space at the moment, especially um, you think about Desart or Ankar or any number of the organizations, it would be great to, to put all that together. And Joseph Lafferty, just, just saying too, that um, we thank you for your input. We'll pass on this correspondence to Brenda. We've got a few questions there about um, arts, um, ACT, of which I'm sorry, we don't have enough access to information to help you there to talk through that particular issue that you're having with Arts SA, SAT, uh, ACT, sorry. So um, we, we will forward that information on to people and um, hopefully they can follow up with you along the way. Um, next slide, thanks, Michelle. I'm gonna introduce um, amazing speakers. Uh, Nancy Bamaga is in charge of Bamaga Productions. Sounds like it's both her place and her name. It's her family. And she's a panel member also of the First Nations Art Strategy Panel. And we will then come after that, after Nancy to talk to Kylie Belling. She's working at Victoria, Creative Victoria as the Senior Manager for First Peoples. Great to see her there as well. Firstly, we might go to Nancy. Um, Nancy, great to see you. Thank you for coming on board. Um, the, just, you know, your work as a, an events organiser, as someone who is really there facilitating so many voices. It'd be great to hear from you a little bit more about what you're doing, uh, how you're doing it, and what your plans are for the future. So talking now and the future. Um, Nancy, over to you. Oh, hello everyone. Um, I don't, I'm not too sure whether you can see me because my uh, screen's shimmering on my end. So I hope you can see me clearly on your end. So um, my name is Nancy Bamiga. I'm from Saibai Island. My family group from there is, of course, um, the Tabu and Samo clan group of Saibai. Uh, grew up in Cape York in Bamiga after my uh, grandfather and the, the clan groups, uh, some of them relocated to Cape York, Bamiga, and were given permission by the local engineer people at that time to relocate there um, due to water restrictions. Uh, uh, climate change issues at, uh, around water, needs of water. Um, so um, I actually live in Brisbane and I've lived here for 30 odd years. And, um, and this is where I came across this uh, beautiful shop called Aboriginal Creations. And for me at that time, we're talking about, um, in 1985, um, I was um, approached by the manager then, John Conway, to come on board as a, uh, part-time casual Torres Strait Islander person, uh, which I, um, you know, took on in the, that shop just totally um, empowered me, totally inspired me uh, to be working in the arts industry. So Aboriginal Creations was um, established back in um, 1958. Prior to that, it was, um, they had a, a 
what we call curio shops back in the day. And this was about making our community self-sufficient. And uh, this shop uh, was the, um, the outlet uh, in, uh, it was in Sherbrooke and it came down to Brisbane. So the Brisbane, right there in the middle of George Street, it started out from there. Um, of course, it was Department of Native Affairs at that time. And, um, but when I walked in there just to see um, all our people's um, artifacts, um, arts and craft, uh, visual arts, it was totally amazing at that time, you know, totally inspired me. And um, I'm just going to... Thank you. We might just move on to the next slide. There's the, um, can you yes, see the next slide, the, the Bamiga production slide? There we go. So I'm currently based in Brisbane and we'll be working across through Saibai and Bamiga. Thank you. Next. And here I am, you can, as you can see at the top there, um, Saibai is right there on the border next to our PNG. And that's how our, uh, my people made the journey there from uh, across to Duan and then all the way across to um, Thursdale and onto our um, uh, mainland where Bamik is now situated. Next. So here's uh, Queensland Aboriginal Creations. You can see some of the tags up there. There's a picture of me in the, in the, on the middle bit there. But, um, I don't, I'm not too sure how, how the screen is looking on your end because it's, um, I've got a bit of uh, um, issues uh, watching it on my end. It's, it's very good at this end, Nancy. We can right, see it right. very Thank clearly. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I worked at that shop, made a lot of connection. It was the time to be there. It was just a community hub, as I was saying. And um, we, uh, I got to meet a lot of special uh, women that I really adored. And uh, one was the, uh, the ladies at that time that used to come and have a couple was uh, Annie Rita Huggins. She used to pop in there. Annie Gloria Beckett, um, Annie Beryl Wharton, um, you know, uh, and of course our local artists, um, people like uh, Richard Bell and uh, Aboriginal Creations also supported Cairns Tafe. So we had all the artists from Cairns Tafe um, uh, showcasing their work at Aboriginal Creations, um, <laughs> such as um, Brian Robinson, uh, Bernard Arke, uh lots and lots of uh, artists. And um, at that time, as I was saying, I think we were also way ahead of our time and way before it's the, uh, the mainstream souvenirs came in, we, were, we had all the authentic art. So it was a, a good model of sustainable, small enterprise supporting local um, um, community um, outlets, such as uh, when we talk about Mornington Island, uh, we're talking about Bamiya had a curious shop as well, uh, uh, going to, to uh, other locations like Lockhart uh, and uh, Cohen, Every, and, and Hopewell, there was a lot of, a lot of um, I think uh, our people at that time was re really a visionary. They were businesses in themselves. They were suppliers uh, for the retail shop of uh, authentic arts and craft. And, um, and they were wholesalers as well. And that, it was just, um, uh, you know, a whole lot of enterprise going on within those outer uh, 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 communities such as um, Sherbrooke. Um, so, um, moving on to my other, other uh, important, um, I guess I'm just outlining for the previous slide had me, uh, my first time I uh, graduated from the University of um, Curtin University and uh, that really helped me centre my uh, practice as a community development practitioner. And of course, Bamiga Production also does uh, festivals and uh, we've done the summit at uh, G20 Summit back in 2014. That was um, yeah, I could only see Obama through the screen. <laughs> I mean, through the curtains, I should say. And, um, and so was everybody else, but through the curtains at the back. Um, it was amazing. And then, of course, we've got the uh, Clan Ancestry Festival down there at QPAC. Uh, QPAC's been amazing. So they continue to do uh, con uh, small um, mini kind of Clan Ancestry events, um, which is, um, in terms of those images, I'm um, just going back to uh, when I was working uh, with um, Brisbane City Council. We had a program in Queen Street Mall called The Gathering. And this was unknown to everybody else around that all of a sudden here in Queen Street Mall was all these traditional dance groups performing. And to see the crowds that used to come and gather to watch all those traditional dance groups of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was quite extraordinary. 
and there was a tag that we came up with. Nowhere else in Australia, but in Queen Street Mall in Brisbane, you will get to see traditional dance groups. And that just made our people so proud to be there and coming there and gathering and supporting those dance groups. And it was about economic development um, with the Brisbane City Council and giving uh, uh, our community uh, uh, a, ch a chance to showcase and shine and have a regular income for that period of time. So that was fantastic. Um, next. Here we go. Um, quickly, here we have some pictures from APAM. On the right, with the Aboriginal dance group, Nunakayagra, that was APAM in 2008. Uh, I was uh, previous to be one of the uh, uh, creative producers and also in 2016. And this was an amazing time and uh, I really enjoyed it. It was to work with um, a lot of our other contemporary uh, uh, dancers locally, but also, you know, including, of course, black dance and then internationally with other First Nations uh, that were coming to APAM there and also participating in the opening ceremony. And uh, that was, uh, you know, incredible time for all of us there to see our first other First Nations brothers and sisters um, that were participating. And so people from Canada to, um, um, of course, NZ. And, uh, and of course, and we've been uh, back then uh, as well in 2019 to see them over in, um, in Manhattan. So that was in New, uh, New York, that was fantastic. So I'm just got another picture here. It was of course the opening for APAM uh, 2020 in Melbourne. We've got Ben down there and Rach, myself and Sarah. And Sarah, amazing young woman, you know, uh, uh, you know to take on a, a big feat, you know, in terms of APAM, what it's looking like right now in terms of Australia. And, um, and hopefully we'll be at Darwin next. And Nancy, you, you really respond, you really work with young people a lot to make a difference. I know you were talking yeah, about Yes, that. and that's why I've got these young people, you know, with this Aboriginal dancers with Nunaki Yagra, I've known them since they were little in, in Brisbane. And they've been going for now th um, almost 30 years. And with these other young people on my, on to, uh, on, uh, my left, um, they are, of course, are from um, Ilbidgeri. And they're just fantastic. And Sarah's in that picture. I just love the energy, you know. To me, like uh, at the stage where I am right now, after doing, you know, a lot of major gigs, uh, local gigs and international gigs in terms of conferences uh, here in Brisbane, uh, it's about the legacy of the work that I do. Um, so having to then work with corporate um, organisations to or a local council, it's about employing and contracting these young people until they can get there. Uh, ex work experience happening. So it's for me, it's been really vital in terms of um, uh, growing our young people for, to be the future leaders, the future Wesley Enochs, uh, the future uh, Rhoda Roberts. <laughs> so yeah, and I just love them and uh, they just inspire me to, you know, you know uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we are going to be fine. You guys are going to be fine. You're going to be make, they're going to make us proud. You're already making us proud. Uh, next screen. Next. Yeah, we've got the uh, Marbo Day 2020 and the beautiful. Okay. Well, this, there now. this is uh, uh, like a community based, volunteer based events, both of these. And, um, and I'm, I'm so proud that we're uh, participating and leading these, these two projects locally here in Brisbane through our community. Now, I'll just go to Marbo Day first. That's coming up, as you know, on the 3rd of June. So prior to Marbo Day, uh, this year is the, um, I, I'll just say Marbo Day is uh, it's the 28th anniversary. And um, we'll start screening uh, at the beginning of that week of reconciliation, um, starting with Sorry Day. So we have a lot of stuff programming. Uh, everything's going to be online on Facebook and, and across other platforms to corporate to um, other online, which is the uh, little lunches online as well. I'm um, working with reconciliation, um, Queensland, across to uh, QPAC. We've got a whole lot of uh, Marble orations that's going to be streaming on that page along with our local performance. With a couple of shout outs, we had a, got a deadly one there from Ben Gratz in, uh, when he was up in Darwin there. Uh, a, a really nice one for, from uh, Tony Janke, so watch out, watch out for those shout outs. Um, and then there's the actual program that'll happen. So we've got uh, connected also with NITV, including a local uh, uh, national indigenous radio services, 
So uh, 4MW, which is up, uh, a cyber up in TI across to 98.9, uh, ABC in Brisbane, uh, so, so we'll have guest speakers there as well. And our local performers, uh, uh, Joe, uh, Joey Tapau is one of the ones from Mer that uh, will be um, screening him on there and um, including lots of other um, artists. A local Torres Strait artist, uh, Tony Jenkins doing a wonderful shout out there, uh, Rochelle Pitt, they're all volunteering their time. Uh, and this is because of COVID and we didn't have a chance to uh, get, get that funding, which we normally get from a Brisbane City Council. And this is what we've got to do. We've got to help each other out and just step up and do what needs to be done. Going back to the next, to the next image there, this is an image by uh, uh, Racy Pitt, uh, Uwe Pitt. And um, she is uh, related to me through my great, great grandfather, who was uh, um, um, Harry New Caledonia, and he um, came with the evangelist at that time with the London Missionary Society to to the um, to um, Arab at that time. So we've got so I've got a lot of connection and if that history on, in terms of my mother's side, and it's important to support our family uh, history. Sorry, Nancy, I'm just going to ask Michelle to go back to the previous slide. Just she's she's just moved on one there, so you can talk about that that print again for us, because it's a beautiful print. And just talk to us about, you were saying that this is an anniversary for the coming of the light. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So um, we're right now, come, come July this year, we'll start working on the marketing and promotions. Uh, we'll just do a, a small local event, but we are preparing for uh, 150 years um, celebrations um, next year in 2021. Uh, so up in the Torres Strait, there'll be some of the uh, poor islands, that are the top Western Islands that are going to be involved. So I'm talking about Duan, Saibai and Buigu and across to, of course, Arab. It'll start off at Arab. And just then... For those, there, just for those people who don't know about what the coming of the light is, do you just want to explain it to, to those who may yes, not know? Um, 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 as I was saying before, uh, the coming of the light was when the uh, London Missionary Society came to, um, to our islands and they're bringing Christianity to our islands. Um, at that particular time. And of course we were, because we we're warfaring um, um, a people on uh, some of those islands, especially Buigo and um, Saibai, we had to then stop the, the fighting across the border with, the, uh, with, with our uh, other uh, family group across the road, um, across the ocean, uh, the Australian border to, uh, you know, fighting each other all that time. So, um, so that ca came to a stop and then our ancestors said at the time, look, we're going to stop fighting. We've got to think about our future generations. Um, and so that's when they started, you know, brought Christianity to the Torres Strait. And as I was saying before, that's the boat. My uh, great, great grandfather came in from uh, New Caledonia and he was with those evangelists from the South Pacific. It's and amazing that it was called the surprise. I didn't realize the boat was called the surprise. <laughs> yes, surprise, Wesley, and the coming, and we're here in the now. <laughs> <laughs> and 150 years, that's a, that's a long time. And I know that's a very yeah. important cultural yeah. event in the time. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so obviously it's gonna, there's gonna be all international people here from the, you know, the churches around, et cetera, here in, uh, in Brisbane. Uh, that we prob and in Brisbane right now, we're already uh, gathering together uh, the cluster groups of those different islands, like Saiba is the top western, and the near western uh, is Mabiog and Badu down there and Moa, and then you go to the central islands, those beautiful central islands, and some of our Coral Cay islands. Um, so we, we will be bringing some of those people down. So if you guys are uh, wanting to see a big Torres Strait Islander festival, you either book your fare now to go up to the Torres Strait, and get yourself, uh, you know, to those locations, or you come here to Brisbane and watch the uh, the whole festival here. Uh, there's a couple of people on the chat there, um, Nancy, just saying how great to hear about this. A number of people didn't know about coming of the light, or or, or in the detail anyway. Oh, you're talking it, about. Uh, can I be cheeky and just say, well, you know, we also have all the different churches in, in Aboriginal Australia. You know, when we talk about the Catholics, you know, um, they were at. Um, Wadai, and they were all at Port Kitts, which is called Wadai at that time. And they had changed their names to, uh, you know, uh, what would you call them, Latin names like um, Giuseppe, uh, Leo, you know, when I'm talking about some of those artists, 
but then they converted back to um, their uh, Aboriginal names. Yeah. So, yeah, and, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, with uh, where the Hermannsburg Potters are and Santa Teresa is, that's all Catholic churches there. So, and, I, and, and so they came, um, came to us as well. Uh, but I think the, um, the impact, I think, it has now, you know, we've got all different church, church groups now here. Yeah. We are, no, I, I, I joked earlier about my name, Wesley James Enoch. You know, I was named Wesley after the Methodist ministers, James after the apostle, and Enoch is a, is a name that comes from Genesis 26. So oh. there's a whole kind of sense of, you know, this power of the church through all of that stuff as well. I, yeah, I think, but, yeah, but Wes, you need to think about what your Aboriginal name is. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think Rhoda, you want to talk to us, Rhoda, but you, you're muted there. So if you wanted to unmute and get, have a little chat to us. Um, so, look, everybody. And so I wanted to know if you could just touch on Bamaga because it's such an extraordinary community um, combining when people came over from the islands and combining yeah. engineering. Okay. Well, I'll of, just talk about that. Very yeah. different dance to everywhere else. Yeah, it's a, it's a both Aboriginal and uh, Torres Strait Islander community. So the Aboriginal communities are Ingenu. Um, they're the ones that let us come to... Um, to live on the mainland there. So the, those traditional owners of that area at that time. Uh, the, uh, the other communities, Torres Strait Island community is Saisia and uh, Bamiga. And so you've got Ingenu, Alau and New Mapun, which is the, the, the Aboriginal communities. And, um, and we've, uh, I, I guess, come together really uh, quickly and come together as family. And I've got my cousin Leonora there, Aditi saying hello. So she's my, uh, she's Bamaga Productions contact person up there. If you want a deadly linguist and interpreter, Torres Strait Islander content, that's her right there. <laughs> um, so, so my cousin there's deadly and she's repping her um, um, a traditional dance group. And I hope to see them. Um, so in terms of my legacy, I want to go and support the festival and do a bit of product development, work with them around um, uh, the uh, enterprises around uh, how to generate with the artists as well, generate um, other revenue streams from their uh, practice, arts practice. So that's what my legacy is about. We're going back to the uh, back home for a couple of months at a time and across to Saibai and build their digital, um, you know, uh, capacity and uh, through technology. So, yeah, watch out to Birmingham Productions. Hey, you more? Excellent. If we move to, the, to your last slide there, Nancy, talk us through. Oh, yes. Um, I'm just waiting for next. So Michelle's probably having issues because that's um, having problems on my hand with this. Uh, on we, my we've got the last slide up there. It says keeping culture strong with lots of hands. Yeah, of young yeah, people yeah. There. I haven't. Oh, there we go. Now this is all young people that I got to come and perform at uh, Suncorp Stadium uh, as extras, and there was uh, uh, a sporting event that was on, and we come in earlier. There was. Um, uh, traditional dance and uh, uh, dig digital review workshop and this is all part of the entertainment component um, but as I was talking about young people young people just continue to inspire me and I just love this picture about them uh, celebrating their Aboriginality celebrating their culture celebrating who they are in this current day um, and they're just beautiful and um, these, once again, it's important to look after our young people mm. and uh, cause they are our future. They are going to carry us into the next century. Nancy, you've got a couple of questions about young people there too. What do you do specifically to help young people get to the next step, to get to the next step so they can? Yes. Yes. Well, I, um, I generally would through the business, uh, employ young people, uh, whether they uh, at that program that was in Queen Street Mall for running for three years, we'd have young people emceeing and we'd have young people also performing a contemporary content through traditional dance. And that was about building pride, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, get, uh, getting you uh, connected strongly to your cultural identity, which is really important. You know, you've got to, we've got to acknowledge young people and celebrate young people and, uh, you know, when we talk about resilience, this, uh, our identity is really important and to make them proud of who they are and how they're contributing uh, positively to, you know, in terms of cultural um, showcases. Uh, and as Rhoda would know all these, because uh, we've worked with Rhoda as well with the Torres Strait Islander Dance Group, uh, Malukiai Muravoya, which is now known as Kuta Zuru. And, um, and I, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of good like-minded individuals out there that are keen to work with us in terms of um, developing that industry within the tr uh, traditional dance space, I would talk about, and the contemporary space. Um, and I have a work with also with Marinda uh, over at Black Dance as a um, part of the Cultural Council of Elders. So we're basically there for them if they want to talk to us about any issues, we, you know, we, um, I give them some, uh, you know, wisdom and advice on how to, uh, uh, to, you know, take care of themselves, you know? Yeah, fantastic. And, yeah. Could I just jump in and mention the mentoring that you do, Nance? Yeah. Um, I think one of the key factors, and maybe you could um, elevate what I'm saying, but having watched you work with young people, it's not about telling them what to do. It's yes. like you put out a hand and you actually guide them in the space. And it's been exactly quite right. Yeah. I think of Davy Thompson, for example. Yeah, Davy was at QPAC at the time Clan Sestry was happening. He was beautiful. And of course, everybody knows everybody. And so I know uh, Davy's grandmother really well, of course, and his mum, Suzanne. Because uh, we at one time were in where the, uh, that location where the, at Bark Holden. And we stayed at Davy's uh, grandmother's house and uh, Suzanne and it was there at that time as well. And that's how we made those connections. So people's, people here in Brisbane are very connected uh, in terms of uh, then you're looking after in, uh, giving the, the, their children or grandchildren, um, you know, a lending hand uh, and guidance. So cultural protocol is of course, is really important. You know, all those things that Terry Jenk is talking about, us old people already know what those things are. We've always had all those things that she talks about, those 10 points that she's talking about. And our protocol's always been strong. So like everybody else, I guess, um, that are listening, uh, we've got to practice and we've got a role model. And I, I know we all do. And uh, because we want to see those young people to mm. you know, come through strong. That's fantastic, Nancy. I'm just straight away just going, where you call yourself an old person? Look hey! <laughs> You're living proof that black don't crack, I think. Oh, thank you, my darling. <laughs> um, Rhoda, we've talked a little bit there. Nancy talked a little bit about incomes as well and developing incomes. In this time of COVID-19, there's been a lot of pressure that uh, many of our income sources through sales or tickets or um, individual gigs have dried up. What have you, have, what have you noticed in this world? Well, there's, there's opportunity online. You know, there's opportunity everywhere. Remember, we are... Uh, uh, our people were traders a long time, uh, since time beginning, before contact. Our people were traders. So it's just about us finding out what, what's the issues and what's the problems, and there's your opportunity. You're going to problem solve what those are right. and, and offer that service to those people. My service, what I was physically doing, i.e. Uh, uh, organising Welcome to Countries, to traditional dance, to guest speakers, etc. everything's now going online with, on Bamila Productions. Mm. Rhoda, I think one of the big things that's happened um, that I've been watching is particularly if people are, um, have young people in their family, understanding various ways of setting up online merchandise um, through a number of different mediums. But I think for people, often they don't have the PayPal or they don't have a lot of the technology. There are certain groups around the country that are offering for artists if they want to sell any of their merchandise, particularly like cultural tourism where the tours aren't happening. Yes. Yes. And um, one of those spaces is the uh, uh, cultural experiences, welcome to country.com. And they're opening up their merch line so that they won't take any commission until phase four. And so if you're losing out on your tours or you know visitation to stuff, you can actually put work online and get a bit of an income from that. So- Fantastic. Yeah, lots of things out there. Well, thank you, Nancy. Thank you for that insight and um, wonderful sense. And that wonderful image that we've been looking at now, keeping culture strong with all those young faces and hands all reaching out is fantastic. It's time to move on to our next speaker. Um, we might go to the next slide, Michelle. and. Rhoda, I might get you to introduce the uh, wonderful Carly Belling. Well, it's wonderful to introduce this Yorta Yorta woman, Miss Kylie Belling, Auntie Carly, I would call her, because of the incredible amount of work she's done. She, of course, works now with Creative Victoria as the senior manager, was a founder of the Obidjuri Theatre Company, an incredible actress. In fact, Kylie was making huge broad strokes on mainstream television as being one of the first 
along with Justine, the late Justine Saunders, but being one of the first women on Aboriginal women on national television to be kissed by a white fella. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And they questioned it. <laughs> Welcome, Kylie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhoda. It must have been a horrible kiss. <laughs> no, we we're all jealous. <laughs> uh, I can remember actually, I had to line up. Um, like, they didn't even reshoot the whole scene. They just three shot kind of you was, you know, like you were here, and instead of the going in for the kiss, punched his arm for the reshoot. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the royal flying doctors for any of those young people that um, didn't know what this television so from being an actor one of the big things you do now Kylie I guess is really work at looking at long-term strategies and involving various um, elements of what it's like from that First Nations viewpoint yes thank you Rhoda and thank you Wesley uh, and you know as the you know um, a representative from um, our, our states and territories um, governments, I guess, too. So I always say that, you know, we're fighting the, the good fight from within. Uh, and it's really, you know, it's good to represent in that way, too. But of course, I begin by uh, acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the lands we're all on today, because never ceded, no matter where we are. And um, it's my great pleasure to be presenting on behalf of Creative Victoria um, exactly what we're doing um, in response to COVID-19 and what's happened uh, pre-COVID and, you know, and how our lives will all change, business as usual will change going forward in these strange and unusual times. Um, next slide. Am I jumping right in? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, okay, and so as I've said before, um, coronavirus is like I'm not presenting on that. Um, and, <laughs> so, and Victoria's First People's Creative Industries. Uh, how hilarious uh, that title is. But, um, you know, we were asked to, um, uh, to respond to um, how our um, respective governments and territories are responding um, uh, in the wake of COVID-19. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'll just give you a little bit of a premise because, you know, I like to tell the story. Um, and, it, it's, um, and it's a really interesting one for Victoria particularly in terms of whole of government. Um, you know, we like to say we're leading the way in terms of, you know, the treaty discussion and the treaty process. And also, I think in terms of where um, introducing um, Aboriginal self-determination into uh, government policy. Uh, and, you know, it's the, it's the kind of thing we've been fighting for always. Um, uh, and um, now that Victoria does actually have 11, the 11 principles of um, self-determination, and, you know, the challenge um, going forward is to always have those 11 principles at the fore of any policies and strategies going forward. Um, so really pleased that we've come to that. Um, um, and, you know, and, and in this time we can work um, together. So next slide, please. These are the two strategies that were um, uh, uh, there were when I first started at Creative Victoria almost a year ago, I was informed. Um, and uh, they're, no, they're now both lapsing programs. So um, pre-COVID, we were working towards the next creative state strategy um, and, uh, and how we would embed Aboriginal self-determination into the next iteration. So that was the work that we were, you know, um, quickly doing before COVID hit. And of course, now those strategies are, um, are put on hold in the near future. Um, but, you know, our work and we're still guided by those 11 principles going forward. So in Creative State 1, so I think it was in 2000 and oh, I can't read that, 16 to 20, um, the first action was uh, of that 
strategy was to develop a First Peoples Action Plan. Two years later, the action plan came into um, to being and the first action out of that was to develop a First Peoples Partnership Group. Uh, next slide, please. And here they are, well, some of them. So through a, a very transparent expression, transparent expression of interest process, uh, a call went out um, uh, late last year for um, First Peoples Victorian creatives to put their hand up if they so cho chose to represent um, on a partnership group who would be the, who would basically lead um, Creative Victoria's work going forward. And um, we had a, a, a panel um, assessed um, by our esteemed peers, including um, Lou Bennett, Dr. Lou Bennett and Deb Cheatham and um, Andrew Jackamos and Arnie Caroline Briggs was on the, um, the selection panel. Uh, and that was known um, as part of the expression of interest process so that this partnership group wasn't, you know, was chosen by a, a, a group of peers and experts. Um, and we came up with this um, pretty uh, amazing list of people who, who represent, who are um, current artists and, you know, who've, who've produced a huge body of work going forward in a, in a number of um, different art forms. Um, so this group's chaired by um, Andrew Jackamost, who I also is our senior abocrat. I'm not sure whether that's an official um, word or title, but, um, you know, it, it uh, serves its purpose here. And um, he, he leads um, uh, or chairs this uh, amazing group. Uh, the reason I'm telling you all this is because um, as we go forward, th this, is, this is who I'm working for, basically. Uh, the Victorian uh, uh, community represented through this partnership group. Next slide, please. Okay, so recent programs, um, uh, pre-COVID that we were working on were uh, a, a traineeship program, um, uh, a First Peoples Investment Program, uh, both for new and emerging artists. So the traineeship program kind of basically speaks for itself, but it was, you know, uh, the opportunity for um, uh, arts organisations to host um, some a, a First Peoples trainee. Um, and that really uh, got a, a um, huge response from the um, uh, creative industries um, throughout Victoria. So there were two tranches who are going forward. Um, of course, um, now, um, during the COVID um, crisis, a number of those traineeships have been put on hold, but a number are still going forward. They're being supported um, to, to work, you know, work from home. So that's really great. And of course, it's emerging and adapting as we move forward. Um, uh, uh, also with the For Pit program, it was a pilot. And of course, um, along with the Emerging Creative Leaders program. Um, now, I guess in the uh, quickly, just in the government space, we were working towards um, uh, the lapsing programs so that we were looking forward to a new budget bid and a new program, a new strategy going forward. But of course, this is all, you know, um, bit on hold at the moment. Uh, so, um, but we're hoping as pilots, they won't be pilots in the next iteration, they will become part of our, you know, our core programming. Um, and of course, there's the Yalingua um, visual arts um, uh, cu curatorial position and fellowship awards that um, uh, we also um, supported. Um, so they, they were a number of the their list of recent um, First Peoples Creative Victoria programs that we had up and running. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and just generally, um, Creative Victoria's response to the um, coronavirus was that um, a strategic investment fund um, was um, put into motion to support our existing organisations. Of course, you know, as 
we all know that I think the creative industries are one of the hardest hit in terms of, well, if you don't have, you know, audience bums on seats, really difficult to move forward. We had to make sure that during this, this process that our um, organisations are still able to, um, uh, to, to work and go forward and support their, um, their employees where possible. Um, so there's a list of our first people's OIPs that um, multi-funded year arts organisations that we support. Um, so, and they will continue to be supported um, um, as we, you know, move forward. Um, and of course, there's a, another round um, uh, for competitive um, process for those organisations going forward. But they're, they're all right um, and um, being looked after at least until next year and beyond. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and this is the one I really want to talk. This is the, this is the exciting one. Um, so, um, Creative Victoria um, have responded with uh, supporting our um, Creative Workers Initiative, um, where um, individuals and um, also micro organisations or collectives or small businesses can apply for this funding. So, um, up to $10,000 for the um, businesses, but $5,000 for individuals. Um, so for, for um, any individual artist uh, negatively affected by um, COVID-19, I kind of, it always makes me think about who was posit positively affected. Um, but you know, uh, maybe, you know, what mask makers or something, but anyway, um, and, and we have responded, of course, First Peoples um, um, Industries have responded in that way as well. So the Sustaining Creative Workers Initiative, you can just go onto the Creative um, Victoria website, go to the, um, the grants portal link and go through, and there's a, a stream one, which is specifically for First Peoples to apply to, for either of these um, quick response grants. Um, and I think, I guess, you know, putting our money where our mouth is that um, all of the First Peoples applications are being assessed by members of our um, First Peoples Partnership Group. There's a quick question uh, here, Kylie, about the, the deadline. Uh, when do the applications for the first stream of applications close? Okay, so um, they close on the 1st of June. So... Um, hey, Kylie, could I ask, um, with the border communities, that are on the cusp of Victoria and New South Wales, can either side apply? They have to be a resident of Victoria. I know it's an ongoing issue with borders. We know that they're not our borders, but yeah, um, government way they are. So uh, yeah, it's a tough one. And border communities have these issues all the time. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, walk over the bridge, put the application in. Go stay with the cousins for the <laughs> night. Hey? I said go stay with the cousins for the night. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and there are also issues around, um, uh, you know, you've got to have access at the, at the moment to um, um, the internet to apply. We've tried to make the application process as, as simple as possible. Um, you know, just a, um, a, you've got to go to the grants um, portal and register and then um, basically there are a few questions about how you've been affected, what you would do with the, um, the $5,000 quick response grant um, to forward your creative um, uh, industry or your creative work going forward during this time and um, yeah and basically not be working full time and um, not to have received a, you're not a current recipient of a Vic Arts grant. And that's about it. Um, and we're trying to make this process, we're assessing them um, week by week so that people are, you know, hopefully, um, you know, the quick response it's working is, you know, you, within three or three to six weeks, um, you've got that, um, those dollars in your account to, to continue, all your, continue all your creative practice. Um, next slide, please. On here, just some, you know, um, what an amazing image um, by Ioani um, Scares. So, and Ioani was the 2020 
your Lingua Fellowship Award recipient. Um, and that was announced down at Tarawara um, Gallery. Oh gosh, so long ago, pre, pre-COVID, <laughs> a few months ago. Yeah. It's interesting in that sense that things will go pre-COVID, post-COVID or current COVID. Yeah. I mean, there's a few questions coming through around, you know, where do you find these responses? It seems like um, the Victorian government, the jurisdiction in Victoria has been very good at opening up these different programs. There are programs in New South Wales. I know that South Australia has opened up a lot of programs. I don't know if there are people out there listening. Um, if there are, if you know of programs that your state jurisdiction is really good at and have made a, a First Nations response to, it'd be great to hear from you. Use the chat window, use all panellists and attendees and tell us a little bit about what uh, your what's happening in your state. Uh, as we were saying, there's, there's lots of things that um, need to be looked at and especially from a First Nations response. What, what have been your responses so far, Kylie, in terms of people coming in and, and starting to put in these applications? Have you seen any um, trends? Um, uh, yes, I guess um, street, because we're stream one um, on the portal, um, you know, this is, this is one, one area where probably it wasn't wise to be first peoples first. Um, we get a lot of people putting in for the wrong stream. Um, so there's a lot of extra work. But, you know, I love the idea. I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, first people's first and that was, was stream one. Um, I know with the, um, for PIP program, sorry, the um, Blackfellas are normally, oh, sorry, should, um, our, our um, first peoples, they're a bit slow to kind of, not slow, but, you know, oh, should we apply, should we not apply? And it's taken a while. For, um, for people to, to get on board and say, yeah, I reckon it's worthwhile, you know. And that's fair enough. I know that, you know, that's the way we operate. It's not, it's not like, you know, um, uh, take our time. Is this, you know, what's, what's the, yeah, you know, um, what are the downsides of this? Um, but really, it is around, you know, in the very first instance, um, responding to people who, who really need it, to our who are, to our artists who are, are struggling at the moment, who have you know lost um, income because of COVID, and they just need that support, um, you know, straight away as, as soon as possible. Hence the quick response, and hence the idea too that um, you've only got a month. Um, apply now rather than later, because it actually says on the website um, until the dollars run out. Basically, first in, first serve. Yes. Um, uh, so in there very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple of people writing here about how intimidating it is to write grant application. In fact, Michelle, we might go to people's faces now if um, we've come to, to Kylie's last slide so we can see people's faces. People feeling intimidated by gr writing grants and things. And it's difficult. I know we've had this conversation in New South Wales. You know, what about video pitching? There's a whole range of different things. And it's, it's hard. There's a, there's a few things that we need to do, don't we, Rhoda? We've talked about this very thing, about how do we get the money to the people who really need it. What's your opinion, Rhoda? Well, it's interesting. It's not just emerging artists or people who haven't put a grant in before. And I think for a lot of artists, they're finding this particular period of time quite difficult because it's always been through an organisation or the theatre company they're working with or whatever that puts the grant in. But I've also noticed in this space that a lot of our senior artists, we, we tend to apologise for our space. We tend to often think that we're not deserving of some of these opportunities. So I would just suggest to anyone, go for it, whether it's a big picture thing or it's something immediate. And Playwriting Australia, for example, has opened up um, for anyone who's writing something. You don't have to have the whole kit and caboodle at the moment, which is really fabulous. And look, if you're having trouble with it, by all means, you can ring people and discuss it. We're all there, we've all been through it. So don't be afraid, um, you know, to put in, but tell us what you actually want to do. I think the key is knowing what the actual project is. Mm. And Kylie, you, you've been doing a lot of work in terms of that cultural advocacy. And it's very interesting to see the treaty discussion, the self-determination discussion happening in an arts and cultural space as well, and how they are 
connected very much so. I mean, just to see those those principles, those 11 principles of self-determination working in, in, in Arts Victoria then, or, or Creative Victoria. I mean, how do you see them being applied through this time, this COVID-19 time? Uh, essentially that it is around, you, you know, um, whenever, whenever we've gone to, you know, um, you know, these huge, you know, mainstream kind of, you know, we've $13 million here for this and it's almost like, yeah, that's fine, but what about for our mob? And we're either not mentioned at all or it's, you know, you've got to go through, you know, and it's right at the bottom, you know. Um, but now, through the, these principles and because, you know, we've got to cater first and foremost for our mob, and it's got to be as, you know, um, that we've got, we're earmarked a certain budget where, you know, and it, and it will only ever go to First Peoples yeah. um, creatives. Um, and it might be that this is that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, you it, don't ever apologise for kind of saying this is the reason this response and, uh, and um, this initiative is here. It's for you. It's for whether you've, you know, you're... Um, uh, been working in the industry for five years or 55 years. If you've been affected, um, adversely affected, and your income has been affected or your creative um, practice has been affected, this is for you. You know, just apply. Don't, you know, um, you know, I don't encourage people, don't be shamed, just, just jump in and, and grab it. And um, yeah, there's very, it, we've tried to make it as easy as possible. And I'm sure throughout um, you know, each state and territory, they, they have similar programs um, and initiatives available. Um, and this is the time to, you know, I understand how difficult it can be. We've made it as, tried to make it as simple as possible and easy to manoeuvre through. Um, and if you, and there are numbers of our workers, Eliza and um, Rochelle on our um, website, give them a ring or give me a ring and I'll help you through it. It's fantastic. Nancy, I'm going to come to you on this one. This notion, too, of how, you know, you write lots of grants all over the place, but you also assess a lot of grants. How do you feel um, writing grant applications? What are the, the tricks that you use or the things you use to get you through it all? Well, yes, I don't apply for grants. I self-generate the income. And, um, yeah, so I don't rely on grants, grants at all. Because it's a use of pay service, how I work. Yeah. You're looking for a welcome to country, bam, there it is. How much, this is how much it costs. So there's lots of different ways of generating income then. The absolutely, idea absolutely. Look at other revenue streams, like I was saying, uh, the physical events are now uh, going on um, online, as online events, uh, what, uh, offering packages of uh, whatever that might be of interest, whether it's about Sorry Day, those significant days, Marbo days. Hey, we've got some guest speakers for you. If you're doing Zoom calls, here they are, bam, done. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, there's a couple of, um, there's lots of support programs going on. I know we'll talk about it soon. The Australia Council has its resilience fund. I know that um, different jurisdictions have COVID-19 response funds. And, and also there's a, a thousand times a thousand, which is basically thousand dollars emergency relief funds that uh, I know Ilbidri have been championing this uh, fund in terms of getting a thousand dollars emergency relief to people who really need it to really apply for these things. And as Rhoda was saying, there's lots of different organizations. I'm just seeing here that Marion Potts has also said that Performing Lions could help with any grant um, application writing. And I'm sure that almost all the um, First Nations arts companies are available and, and could help you write those grant applications as well. I think one of the other opportunities that we're seeing as we grow within the sector, but particularly across the mainstream is we are seeing Aboriginal representation in all levels. And so feel safe, I guess, if you're writing a grant or you haven't written one before. And as um, uh, Haley mentioned, grant writing in itself can be an art itself, which is true. Mm -hmm. But I think sticking to the guidelines, knowing what the criteria is, giving a very clear description of what your project is, but also bear in mind, there are arts workers on those panels now assessing um, First Nations work. So you do have an ally and an advocate within those bigger organisations. 
Agreed. And you've said here too, Rhoda, the idea of this peak advocacy cultural body. I mean, there's been a national conversation around the National Indigenous Arts and Cultural Authority, the NIACA. Um, which do you see that that might play a role going forward? I should ho certainly hope so. But I mean, we should have a major national cultural body authority, but we also should be seeing it in regional sectors and in urban sectors. I mean, one of the big things for New South Wales and I think for regional areas right across the country, the limitation to an arts centre or an arts outlet or a regional theatre company. So we have to also consider that organisations like Ilbidjuri, Black Dance, Mugulun, Yerra Yarkin, often uh, overloaded because so many people in the community uh, come to them because in some sectors, particularly regional sectors, and I note that up in Queensland, people are saying, how do we get a regional cultural place? Mm, agreed. And the art centre movements have been a big thing in terms of some of those organisations that are happening in the visual arts are, are around the place, let alone film in particular. Um, Nancy and Kylie, thank you so much. It's great to hear your words, to see your faces now as we kind of talk through all this. Um, Nancy, do you want something? To yes, I, yeah, I want to just say last thing to you um, and to whoever's listening. Um, and obviously, you've got to look at your structure, what your business structure is. I'm a company limited by guarantee, so PTY LTD. Uh, we, uh, with Colleen Wall and Deb Bennett, we did have a social enterprise. Um, ages ago, so they were doing the applications through the social, social enterprise, which we had um, uh, some training um, program running through there for our arts, um, the traditional dance groups, you know, in terms of business uh, elements, the essential business elements that they might need to know in terms of their business, uh, being sole traders or whatever they might be doing, um, you know, um, just a, um, someone that's uh, you know, self-sufficient, but however, it is important to know which is the business structure for your business. You must know that. Uh, otherwise, you're, you know, swimming against the, the tide, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you feel that you've got to adapt from a social enterprise, you, you should have a business arm with that generate income, but you can have the social enterprise there that makes the money uh, yep. for you know, developing and training. To balance those two things out. Mm -hmm. Kylie, just to finish up with what you were saying before, you were saying earlier on there's a number of lapsing programs. Are you pessimistic or optimistic that those programs will come back post COVID and or, or morph into something that will be very val valuable to the community as well? Um, I think we have to adapt as much, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the, but the idea is we need to be able to be representative of our mob. So, you know, we need to know exactly what's going on out there, how you're adapting um, and, you know, life after COVID. Um, and, you know, I don't think we'll ever take um, online for granted ever again, you know, and, and or that it will become a part of our lives going forward um, and all the ramifications of that. Um, but I, I'm hoping that, you know, yet yeah, the pilots, the, the lapsing programs, that we can go from strength to strength. And, mm. um, yeah, so... Um, uh, and the more uptake we have of, um, mm. you know, the, um, our response, our, our initiative, the more, um, basically, you know, um, ammunition that gives us to say, look, we have a thriving, um, adaptable, um, you know, living, breathing um, creative industries, first people's creative industries that needs to continue to be supported and grow, grow from strength to strength. Um, gratuitous um, advertising here in the background. Um, I have the wonderful Destiny Deacons um, NGV um, exhibition apology here. Um, and they're now available online. Uh, and also, thank you so much to my Creative Victoria team. It is just deadly, you mob. You put up with me, me going rah, rah, rah. And, um, uh, and you know, we'll continue to go from strength. And, um, and please, people, you know, everyone out there, look after yourself, look after each other and take advantage of, you know, um, the, the responses that are out there as well. And Carly, can I ask you a question before you go? Yeah. I, I'm just curious, I noticed like, and, and congrats to Destiny, big pioneer, but um, 
have you seen a focus with the people um, uh, requesting grants? Is there a specific genre or are you starting to see a flexibility in the broader genres or almost a collaborative, holistic nature of where it is film and dance or music and, yeah, can you just advise? Because I think a lot of people might just think theatre, music, dance. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's like our... Um, uh, partnership group is representative of you know the multitude of of um, arts disciplines so are the applications that are coming in and um, you know I keep saying these are our constituents going forward so you know in a way I know probably um, um, uh, to answer your question it's it's visual artists it's um, uh, performers, you know, it's around um, wanting to do uh, creative development work in, you know, and so many different um, areas. So that's the exciting thing, just finding out too how many um, artists are out there um, wanting to pursue their their work going forward, and um, yeah, and who haven't applied for funding before. So it's really great to see. All right, folks, we're we're, we're coming to the to the end here, and there's a few comments coming through. Um, Val McGrath talking about uh, volunteering to try and get something up in your community as most of us put it, uh, put it in so much and we get sometimes frustrated uh, when we don't see us getting anywhere. And there's uh, uh, um, Tara Daniel is talking here. She's at the Heidi Museum and she's talking about a number of uh, opportunities that might be there, but it needs to go through a different company through a different stream. I'll let you read that comment there in, in the um in the chat box as it goes through. Some great things to look at there. Um, just remember Marbo Day coming up. We might return to the PowerPoint presentation now, Michelle, so that we can go through this last little bit. Next slide, thanks. Yes, just looking at some of the resources that are coming our way as um, we um, check out um, the different things that are that are there. Um, just saying there, Rhoda, amazing things from the different bodies that we're seeing around the place. Uh, Lottery West COVID-19 grants, uh, if you're in WA, that you can kind of tap into that. Oh, and my phone's going off. Don't you know I'm busy? Don't ring that phone. Um, and <laughs> and uh, Playwriting Australia, as Rhoda talked about earlier, has some First Nations program, the Ignition program there to help um, writers to, to get through. And also uh, the uh, Theatre Network Australia, I talked about this earlier, the thousand times a thousand crisis cash for indies. So have a little look at that. I, I'm gonna say that's a, a nationwide program, given that it's the Theatre Network Australia. Uh, and I think maybe give yourself a very open definition of what theatre is. Don't feel like you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're stuck in, if you're, if you're working mostly in a kind of dance storytelling world, I, I'd call that theatre, jump in. Um, uh, Sharina Clanton talking there, that is still building up donations. Uh, so it's not accessible yet, um, but it's coming. I know, I, I know I've made a donation already. So there is kind of opportunities there for people. And I want to make sure that First Nations people get that support as well. And of course, ABC have just announced through ABC Classic that they are looking for young composers. So Ryan, Dobby, if you're listening out there, Brenda Gifford, anyone young composers to look at securing work while this is happening and applying for their quick grants to compose a small score, which they'll then begin to play on RN Classic. Oh, that'd be amazing. Um, Tara Daniel, yes, maybe, maybe it'd be good to um, have a little chat to Kylie about that. Sorry, I realise you're just talking to the panellists, not to everyone, sorry about that. Um, next slide, thanks, Michelle. Uh, just the some of the support that might be there, especially in our mental health in our communities, Rhoda, isn't it? It's one of those things that we really need to keep an eye on. Uh, Beyond Blue has been doing uh, a lot of um, help um, for lots of different people. And also there are some resources in Indigenous languages that you might want to drop in if you, if you need those specific um, supports. And some resources in English aimed at Indigenous communities in remote areas as well. Check them out because I know that it, this is not just a financial issue, it's not just about isolation, but it's also about how we're feeling inside during this stuff. Because if we're gonna come out of it strong, we'll really, really need to have a strong sense of uh, opportunities and thoughtfulness, don't you think, Rhoda, about how we will recover in, out of this situation? 
Absolutely. We really need to look at that recovery and what the long term after this is. But I think most importantly, there are many people working in isolation. A lot of artists are and they tend to reflect a lot. And I would advise it is important that you're still connected to your sector or there are people to talk to because uh, too much in a belly butting viewing can be a little <laughs> bit. You yes, know, all you get is labels, they call it. But I think for our mob, we are looking at our memories. We're reflecting on what's needed in the community. Surprisingly, um, we have great opportunities for our artists that I didn't expect. I think the country has come on board. And quite surprisingly, the country wants to hear about First Nations. They've gone through fire recovery. They understand now, hey, folks, geez, after all this time, we actually know what we're doing on our country. Um, and so I applaud that sort of area for people in rural areas and that there's lots happening in those other community development areas. But can I just give a big shout out? Because for me, one of the most devastating moments of this occurring was our young artists. We had artists lined up that were going to be earning 10 grand who were going into creative development and so forth, and we had to cancel it all. So the Opera House has looked at a great opportunity. We've actually set up a stage, a stage. And um, so we've gone to those artists that we were going to employ and we're doing these concerts online, but we're actually getting the artists into the theatre, an empty theatre, which is another experience in itself, filming them and then putting these concerts. And during Reconciliation Week, we will have a lot. We've got uh, Bow and Arrow and Dobby and a whole heap. But I think if there's, I'm giving a shout out to my colleagues, if there's something that you can do for those people that work in events from stage management to the artists on stage, anything small to assist them is not about the income. We do the work. We all know we work in the arts for bloody nothing. But mm -hmm. it's about that spiritual well-being. It, but really and truly, it's keeping the momentum of an artist. They cannot stagnate. Yes. We might go to the next slide there, Michelle. The Australia Council website there to, to tap into, especially these roundtables. All of this material is all being recorded and will all be there on the website within, well, by the end of the weekend. So you can check out the Australia Council website for some funding and also the Resilience Fund, which we'll talk about in a second, and COVID-19 information. Remembering that this is a national broadcast, we're talking to everyone nationally, but in fact, state by state, and sometimes even region by region, there are differences. Like I know in New South Wales at the moment, we're allowed to go to cafes if there's you know, less than 10 people, but that's not the case in Victoria, I think it is. So there's lots of differences happening across the nation. And you know that if you're in um, the Northern Territory, you're allowed to have 500 people at a party, which I think we should all go to Northern Territory for a party, if that's the case. Um, and also there's some Facebook groups that you can look at. You can go back and have a little look at all of these um, things that we're talking about. Just the next slide, thanks, Michelle. We've been talking about this over and over and over again. You know, the, the Australia Council is very open to a whole range of changes. If you're currently receiving money from the Australia Council, have a look at it, you know, come and have a conversation, talk about what might need to shift or change and that there's some online services and, and um, support initiatives around the place that you can get hold of. If you have any questions about what's needed, please send an email to inquiries at australiacouncil.gov.au, talk to a grants officer, reach out to, you know, you've got mob there in Australia Council to have a chat to as well, like Kyla was saying, we're all there, get in there and have a look, or even talk to artslaw.com.au. We're coming up to our last little bit. Um, next slide, thanks. I, I earlier talked about the Resilience Fund. There are three areas there and it closes on the 28th of May. So that's not very far away. What's that? Let's call it two weeks away. Um, so there's the Survive, the small grants for individuals and groups, ADAPT for individuals and groups and organisations there to adapt their practice and also to create if you want to create new materials. Look at the, the um, information online about the Resilience Fund and get that going. Um, you can apply to both the Australia Council for the Resilience Fund and Creative Victoria for the uh, Grants Fund there. So there's lots of things, Lydia Miller there saying, tap into all those monies, those monies are there to support you. 
There's no use keep letting, letting those places have it in their bank. Put it in your bank, love. Get in there. Get, a, get amongst it. Because if you leave it in their bank, God knows it's not going to come to you. You've got to go in there and knock on that door and say, you know, give it to me. Make sure you write out those things as, as well. Um, on to the next um, slide. Thanks, Michelle. And next week there, Rhoda, we've got, we'll have um, Leanne Buckskin joining us again. She'll come back. And uh, we'll be looking at Dr. Terry Jenke, who's a solicitor and director of Terry Jenke and Company. And everyone will know Terry as uh, pretty much one of the leaders, in fact, in uh, bringing together a lot of the um, uh, intellectual property rights and laws around the place. And also Dr. Lyndon Orman Parker, a senior research fellow at the University of Melbourne. Oh, Rhoda, I always seem to kind of race at the end, trying to get all this stuff together. <laughs> There's so much there. And there's yes, people saying it'd be great to see Terry because we've been talking about digital, digital sovereignty a lot over this time too. What does it mean to have digital sovereignty? Um, what, does it, what does digital sovereignty mean to you, Rhoda? Yes, well, I'm still fighting for our unceded land. So yes. to get on the multimedia is a difficult one. But I think one of the, uh, the things is the more we go digital and I know with art centres and Actually, I'm going to have to post it on Facebook, but seeing some of the appropriation of material mm. by what I would term plastic shamans is quite frightening. In fact, Nancy, I need to send you a link of um, appropriation of Torres Strait Islander men's headwear on women dancing somewhere around oh. the world. Um, so there is that fear that some cultural content gets used and abused and mm. how we protect that. And I think that would be something I'd be very interested in because our sovereign right of that inherited legacy of our cultures, but how do we protect it on the mainstream mm. net? Nancy, I might give you, we've got just a minute before we wrap up. What's your quick little summation of digital sovereignty? And then I'll come to Kylie to give us a final word on that. I feel that, you know, under NIACA, we really need to be, you know, uh, look at those strategies and, um, and talk to everyone around what that, platform is going to look like for digital sovereignty. What is the content about? Is it, is it to do with cultural protocol? How do we then implement some of those strategies around cultural protocol and looking at copyright and all that? I guess that's a very much a Terry Jenke um, thing. Mm. And, and those points, 10 points of hers that she put out, that's what people don't understand. You know, when we're talking about sacred objects and all those stuff, you know, the 10 points that she put out, people need to look at that to have an understanding of why we and, and stop using the word costumes, please. You're, you, people are wearing their traditional dance regalia. They are not costumes. We're not playing cowboy and Indians. We're just showing <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, that's uh, it. <laughs> Riley, just your, your take on digital sovereignty before we finish up. Um, I have, I forget to, you know, take the mute button off most of the time. So I'm not very good about any of this digital stuff. But, you know, it is around a national, international response that we, that, you know, we just need, um, uh, yeah, a huge government response to, to um, ensure that everyone understands exactly what digital sovereignty is, um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, just like any other form of sovereignty that, um, you know, you have to take into account first people's first, you know, that's it. That's, we've got to lead with that. And listen to us and let us let us shape it, is what I'm hearing you say. Rhoda, thank you very much. It's great thank to have you on. You, you're such a, a font of knowledge. And I think Nancy and Kylie, thank you to Big thank you to everyone who's joined us, almost 100 people joining us online there to kind of listen. We'll hear you next week. We'll get you here next week. Everyone join in to listen to um, the wonderful Terry Jenke and uh, uh, Lynn Norman as well. Talk a little bit about this idea of digital sovereignty. Um, big thank you to everyone. Rhoda, why don't you give us our final word? Uh, a big thank you. Don't forget, tune in next week. Um, keep networking, keep supporting each other. Look at those resources. And let's all just give a big clap to Wesley, Enoch, Kylie Belling and Nancy Bamagar for and Lydia Miller for having the foresight to have these webinars. Marvellous. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks to the whole team. Bye. Ciao. Bye.